Hello, and thank you for joining me. Coming up on the show today, lots of news and safety tips, including an Arizona flight instructor is arrested, and it's not for giving lousy flight instruction. Cessna is ending production of this well-known aircraft. An Aztec pilot loses his landing gear in flight. We'll tell you how he accomplished that. A U.S. airport is continuing testing of a remote tower that's equipped with cameras instead of humans. And skydivers now have a new way to get up to altitude to make a jump. Plus, what you should know about portable ADS-B receivers and why they may not show you all the traffic that's closest to you. Plus, listener email, including this question. What is being done in general aviation to cut down on the cost of uh, specifically flight training? And I'll tell you about an innovative new program going on very close to this gentleman that looks like it will cut the cost of flight training. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about, yep, my favorite topic, general aviation. I'm Max Truscott. I'm here to share my over 40 years of experience as a licensed pilot, author, and flight instructor, and bring you news and safety tips to help you fly safely. And here's how you can help me. If you like the show, please tell all of your friends. And special thanks to the two people who left iTunes reviews last week. I picked one review, which I'll read at the end of the show. All this and much, much more, and the news starts now. From the Wichita News, an Arizona flight instructor is jailed in Kansas, charged on a $2 million cocaine smuggling operation that police busted last week in Liberal, Kansas, which, by the way, is an airport I landed at last year. Patrick Williams, 51, of Tempe, Arizona, and Richard Lopez, 26, are charged with distributing cocaine, conspiracy to commit distribution, and several other charges. Now, the Department of Homeland Security got information that led them to a suspicious plane landing at the airport in Liberal. The Seward County Sheriff's Office assisted meeting the aircraft on the tarmac and identifying the people inside. Williams and Lopez were arrested, and law enforcement seized 144 pounds of cocaine as well as the aircraft. According to FAA records, the 1970 Beach 70 Queen Air, a multi-engine aircraft, was just recently purchased, and an application for registration was uh, noted as being in progress. On his website, Williams says he's a commercial contract pilot, certified flight instructor, and advanced ground instructor. He writes that he began flight training while in the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado, and he had his first powered aircraft solo in the mid-1980s. His company, Fly Waz, offers flight training services out of Falcon Field in Mesa, Arizona. A criminal check shows that Williams was found guilty of two counts of fraudulent schemes from crimes he committed in 1994 in Maricopa County, Arizona. Bond is set for $2 million for both men. From AvWeb, Cessna has confirmed that the last Cessna Mustang has rolled off the production line. Over 12 years, Cessna produced over 470 copies of this light twin jet, which was marketed as an entry-level aircraft for owner-operators transitioning to multi-engine jets. The Mustang proved to be an incredible success for our company and our customers, said Rob Scholl, Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Cessna. Mustang customers can continue to expect the highest levels of service through the maintenance parts and support solutions organization, says uh, Kryla Short, Cessna Senior Vice President of Customer Service. Since its introduction in 2013, the Cessna M2 has cut deeply into sales of the Mustang, which went from selling about 40 aircraft a year to just 24 units in the prior three years combined. The M2 is also certified for single pilot operation, but is faster and larger than the Mustang while operating out of nearly the same size runway. From Fly Magazine, the FAA recently complied with the president's order to federal agencies to begin comprehensive regulatory reforms. Also known as the two-for-one rule, the executive order requires that two regulations be removed before any single new regulation can be introduced. And I think Flying was editorializing just a little bit when they said this might be an easier task for the FAA than other agencies due to the overabundance of unnecessary and outdated regulations. 
Anyway, they continue the FAA's regulatory reform task force will not only make its own recommendations for repealing and modifying existing regulations, but it's also accepting recommendations from a broad spectrum of entities affected by regulations they deem outdated, unnecessary, or ineffective. Additionally, the task force will identify regulations that eliminate jobs or inhibit job creation as well as any that create a serious inconsistency or otherwise interfere with regulatory reform. An initial report is due out by June the 1st. From AvWeb, bucking the long-term trend, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, otherwise known as GAMA, has first quarter sales data that shows a 6.3 increase in sales of piston aircraft over the same quarter in 2016. Now, this bucks the trend because piston aircraft have been generally declining in sales in recent years. They say the allocation of sales within the piston market was unremarkable, though Cessna had real gains shipping 41 piston singles compared to just 27 aircraft for the prior uh, same year period. Although total GA shipments were up compared to uh, last year, billings were down over 10%, reflecting mostly a softening in the large business jet market. Most of the decrease can be attributed to Bombardier alone, whose sales decline of $270 million was more than most manufacturers' total revenue. Two-thirds of all GA aircraft sales in Q1 of 2017 went to either Bombardier or Gulfstream. Now, just to give you a flavor for how the world has changed, I went out to the Gamma.Aero website and I pulled up the first quarter production numbers uh, for different uh, piston aircraft companies. On the top, Cirrus, which sold uh, 57 uh, pistons, Cessna, which sold 40, Piper, which sold 22, Diamond 21, Beechcraft 8, and Mooney 2. So it's really quite surprising. Cessna used to always be on top. Piper was always number two. And now Diamond is virtually tied with uh, Piper. And of course, uh, Cirrus is selling far more uh, aircraft than uh, any of these companies. From aeronews.net, in a continuing sign that regional airlines are finally starting to pay decent uh, wages to their pilots, Air Wisconsin Airlines has announced significant enhancements to its existing bonus program, increasing the value of cash bonuses to $57,000, including $8,000 for pilots who are type-rated in a turbine aircraft. When added to Air Wisconsin's competitive wage structure and best-in-class benefits, these increases position Air Wisconsin as the regional airline industry leader in new hire pilot compensation. The article says that during the first three years of employment, a new pilot will receive between $260,000 and $317,000 in total pay and elected benefits. Also, they say new hire pilots can expect to upgrade to captain in 18 to 24 months, likely faster for pilots hired in the next several months, as Air Wisconsin is dramatically expanding its pilot group in connection with its recently announced long-term agreement with United Airlines. And I think this is great news. Uh, Regional airline pilots have been underpaid for way too long. From AOPA, a mobile control tower that's been in testing since last fall to evaluate remote air traffic control technology at Virginia's Leesburg Airport will begin working directly with arriving and departing aircraft this summer. The airport will be under the control of the remote air traffic control tower daily from June 5th through August 12th and from August 13th to September 18th. Uh, The Saab Census remote air traffic control system is being used, and it has cameras mounted on top of the airport terminal to give controllers a clear 360-degree view of the airport. Leesburg is the first test site for the system. FAA validation of the technology could eventually lead to the establishment of remote control towers and Class D airspace at the airport. Now, as a precaution, a temporary control tower from which controllers can directly view the airport will be staffed and be ready to take over operation during operation of the remote tower, where controllers will view the traffic uh, they are controlling on a computer screen. This redundancy is expected to make the remote tower testing transparent to pilots. As part of the evaluation process, FAA aircraft will conduct traffic pattern operations while the remote tower is open. Pilots are encouraged to check NOTAMs to airmen frequently and to consider the Leesburg maneuvering area to be an equivalent of Class D airspace during operations of this remote air traffic control tower. Now, a remote control tower is less costly to build and maintain than a traditional tower, and the technology is designed to allow air traffic controllers to work either at the airport or from a remote location. 
elicited proposals for a remote tower at Fort Collins with that process closing in March, and the agency is now in the process of selecting a contractor for that facility. From AOPA, Garmin continues its march into the business jet market with an announcement that the company's new Garmin heads-up display, the GHD2100, will be installed as an option in Cessna's upcoming Citation Longitude super mid-sized jet. The price has not yet been announced. The HUD will be part of the Longitude's G5000 integrated flight deck, and it will be compatible with other business jet cockpits. Now, HUDs project infrared or synthetic vision imagery on a combiner plate that flips down into a pilot's view. This allows significantly improved forward vision and reduced visibility, and in other situations where visual cues would normally be limited or absent altogether. This should translate into safer approaches, day or night, in low instrument meteorological conditions, and perhaps the ability to descend to lower instrument approach minimums in the future. When it becomes operational, the Garmin HUD will allow operators to fly down to Category 1 and 2 approach minimums. And here's news for people looking for flight training from AOPA. Deadlines for AOPA's two scholarship programs are fast approaching, with applications for the High School Flight Training Scholarship closing May 19th and the AOPA Foundation Flight Training Scholarship closing May 31. There are two programs with scholarships from $2,500 to $5,000. Under the High School Flight Training Scholarship program, 20 teens will be able to receive up to $5,000 toward flight training. And under the AOPA Foundation Flight Training Scholarships, passionate aviators will get awards that range from $2,500 to $5,000 in 2017. Now, the minimum age for those scholarships is 16, and there is no maximum age. Also from AOPA, FAA publishes clearance delivery phone numbers. Now, this directly relates to a listener question we had uh, last week. Uh, Pilots will have a new option for receiving IFR clearances directly from some air traffic control facilities with the publication of clearance delivery phone numbers in the April 27 edition of the Chart Supplement, which was formerly called the Airport Facility Directory. That's the, the green book. The phone numbers for 30 terminal facilities that serve about 650 airports were published as part of an FAA flight service modernization initiative, giving pilots another way to receive their clearances directly from air traffic control, in addition to the published radio frequencies. This is intended to increase efficiency by eliminating the need for the clearances to be relayed to a pilot by flight service. The streamlined process also reduces the risk of error, the FAA said in a notice provided to to AOPA. An example of a newly published clearance delivery phone number appears in the chart supplement entry for Virginia Leesburg Executive Airport, which, by the way, is exactly where the listener had the question last week. It says, for clearance delivery control, contact Potomac Approach at 866-709-4993. That's the, the phone number. The FAA said 12 ATC facilities also will eventually offer a separate phone line for pilots to call and cancel IFR flight plans. The phone numbers will be published as they are installed. In international news from Flyer Magazine, that's the UK publication, a Latvian company, Aeroness, has performed the world's first human flight and parachute jump with a drone. Their 28 propeller drone lifted a skydiver to a height of about a thousand feet. Then he let go of the drone and landed with his parachute. The jump was made in a rural area of Latvia in cooperation with the state radio and television center, whose 120 meter high communications tower was used as a takeoff platform for the jumper to reduce the risk. Now, I think the risk they were trying to reduce would be that area of uh, probably the first couple of hundred feet where if there was a failure for the drone, the jumper might not be able to deploy his parachute in time uh, before he uh, reached the ground. So in the video, what you could see was the drone took off from the ground. It flew up to the top of the tower, which was 120 meters or what, about 360 feet high. From there, the uh, parachute jumper grabbed onto a a handle at the bottom of the uh, drone. The drone then continued to lift him up to a thousand feet then when he was ready he just let go of that handle and uh, released his parachute so who knows maybe this will turn out to be a more cost effective way for uh, people to go skydiving on the other hand i hate to think what would happen if he got caught in those propellers if the uh, the drone were to malfunction moving back to u.s news from aviationpros.com 
the Colorado legislature has approved the creation of an aviation-themed license plate, which is expected to be available in September of 2018. The Support Colorado Aviation license plate will give Colorado aviation professionals, pilots, and enthusiasts a way to showcase their love and passion for aviation. The plate is sponsored by the Support Colorado Aviation Project, a collaboration of several state aviation groups. Last fall, the petition for the plate exceeded the required 3,000 signatures and was approved to move forward in the legislative process. The plate will be available to any Colorado resident with a registered vehicle in the state for a one-time fee of $50. Now, I was curious, so I did a quick uh, search online. There are only a few states in the United States that offer aviation-themed license plates. So here's a good project for you to go out and uh, petition your state legislature for an aviation-themed license plate. I'm thinking I'd like to do that uh, for California. And finally, from aeronews.net, how that Aztec pilot lost his landing gear. The story says that a truck driver by the name of Russ Street was driving a semi-tractor trailer along Ohio Highway 53 last week when he heard a loud thump and felt the trailer rock to the point he thought it was going to topple over. Then he stopped the truck at the Fremont Airport and he found, embedded in the side of the empty trailer, the landing gear for an airplane. Now, the landing gear was previously attached to a Piper PA-23-250 Aztec being flown by 71-year-old John Randall of Fremont, Ohio, according to the Ohio State Troopers. The Sandusky Register reports that Randall had been on a proficiency flight and was returning to the airport when the accident occurred. Now, the Aztec is registered to Randall, according to FAA records. He reportedly has about 3,500 hours in his logbook. Randall managed to belly land the airplane on the runway at Fremont Airport and skidded off onto the grass uh, next to the runway. Neither he nor Street were injured in the incident. It was not reported how Randall managed to be so low that he struck the truck with his extended landing gear while on approach. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up in a moment, why those portable ADSB receivers don't show you as much traffic as you may think they do. And a listener question asking about basic med and its limitations if you're acting as a safety pilot for someone who is flying under a hood. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And before we talk about portable ADSB receivers, let me give a quick shout out to Brett K. Brett's from Melbourne, Australia. He's visiting here in the United States, and he came out to the Palo Alto Airport yesterday here in the San Francisco Bay Area to fly with me. Now, interesting story, Brett's a helicopter pilot. Uh, he doesn't have experience as a, uh, a, a airplane pilot, and so it was kind of interesting. He's thinking about trading his Robinson R44 helicopter in for a Cirrus SR22. So we spent about three hours together and flew a late model SR22 around the Bay Area, and I think he really liked it, though he noted that flying an airplane is quite different from flying a helicopter. I think in particular, he noticed that the control forces in an airplane are much stronger. Uh, in a helicopter, basically, you you barely touch the controls. I mean, you, you, you just kind of kind of think you're moving them, but you barely move them at all. In the airplane, yeah, you have to physically move them around. So he was a little surprised at how big a difference there is in uh, control movement. Interestingly, as we were getting ready to go, we talked with another Cirrus pilot who had just landed. He had flown in from another state, and he said, quote, I didn't realize how short the runway was until I was on final. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Brett and I both kind of looked at each other and kind of hoped he uh, didn't mean what it sounded like he meant. Uh, you know, perhaps he was saying, gee, the runway looks really small when, when you're on final. But what he said actually implied that he didn't know the length of the field that he was about to land on. And boy, that should never happen because regardless of what kind of aircraft you fly, you should always know the length of the runways you're using. In fact, it's not a should. It's a requirement. It's in the FARs. 91.103 says for any flight, you must know the runway runway links at all airports that you intend to use. So anyway, kind of an interesting little sideline from my fl flight with uh, Brett yesterday. And a couple of days ago, I was interviewed on another podcast, the FS Ride Along podcast. Now, FS stands for Flight Simulation. And Nicholas Jackson is a pretty hardcore flight simmer. He spends as much as 50 hours a week flying his uh, flight simulator. So in that episode, we talked about some of the similarities and differences between people who fly uh, home uh, PC-based flight simulators and folks who are flying airplanes. So you can search for FS Ride Along, which is all one word. 
And this is the part of the show where I talk briefly about the three different ways you can support the show. The most important way is if you enjoy it, please, please, please tell your aviation friends about the show. You can phone them up or you can forward this episode in email. Whatever it takes, just let them know. The next way you can support it is to leave a review on iTunes, and I'll mention at the end of the show how to do that. And the third way, if you don't want to be up there in the air wondering which buttons to push, go ahead and sign up for one of my online courses at pilotlearning.com. We have courses currently on the Garmin G1000, both for IFR and uh, VFR operations. And there's a GPS and WAS course for those of you who are flying the latest fancy GPS approaches with WAS, such as LPVs and LNAV plus V. If you want to know all the details about those, you'll want to sign up for that course. Courses range from $59 to $79, or you can take all of the courses for a low monthly membership of $29.95. You can sign up for an entire year if you'd like for $2.99, which is the same as getting two months free. And if you sign up for the full year, you'll get a one half hour consulting call with me on any topic you'd like to discuss. Okay, let's talk about portable ADS-B receivers. I'm prompted to do this because yesterday I was doing a checkout with uh, somebody who was interested in flying an airplane. He brought with him his Stratus uh, portable uh, ADS-B receiver, and I mentioned to him, are there any limitations to what traffic you can see on that? And he thought, no, this shows everything that's out there. And I thought, wow, I thought everybody knew this about portable ADS-B receivers, but apparently not. So let's take one step backwards, talk about ADS-B. Uh, I'm going to quote here from an article I wrote when I was a columnist at EAA magazine a few years ago. And I wrote that the ADSB stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcasting. Now, there are two ADSB capabilities. There's ADSB out. That's the only one mandated by the new rule. And it refers to an aircraft broadcasting its position and other information. Unfortunately, aircraft equipping with ADSB out will spend thousands but not gain any new benefits. Owners can elect to equip with ADSB in, which allows an aircraft to receive traffic information from other ADSB out equipped aircraft, surface vehicles, and FAA ground stations. A one type of ADSB in equipment can also receive free in cockpit weather information. Now, ADSB won't be required everywhere, but it will be required if you're going to fly above 10,000 feet MSL, unless you're within 2,500 feet of the ground, which means you'd be next to a mountain somewhere. Uh, also, if you're within 30 miles of some mostly Class B airports, it's going to be required. And when flying either under or above or through Class Bravo and Charlie airspace, there is an exclusion related to flying within 30 miles of Class B airports for any aircraft not originally certificated with an engine-driven electrical system. Now, a significant clue in the FAA's ADSB architecture is that there are two standards for ADSB, 1090 ES and 978 UAT, which operate on different frequencies. Now, the upshot of that is that aircraft equipped with 1090 ES cannot directly detect UAT equipped aircraft and vice versa. Instead, they have to rely on about 800 sets of cross-linked ground-based transceivers that rebroadcast all the ADSB signals they receive on both frequencies. This allows all ADSB equipped aircraft, regardless of the frequency they use to see each other, except when they are not within line of sight of a ground-based ADSB site. Uh, this can occur particularly at low altitudes, so pilots of all ADSB equipped aircraft still need to look out the window to avoid other aircraft. Now, in the U.S., aircraft flying above 18,000 feet will be required to equip with 1090 ES. Aircraft that remain below 18,000 can choose either 1090 ES or 978 UAT. Most other countries are using the 1090 ES standard, so aircraft owners traveling internationally will want to equip with 1090 ES. But 978 UAT will be attractive to some owners since it can display free weather data in the cockpit. Now, how did we get to ADSB standards? It seems kind of weird, right? 978 UAT is technically a superior system since it's got a faster data transfer rate and it can accommodate up to 500 aircraft simultaneously. However, the airlines weren't particularly interested in free weather and they preferred a system that was compatible with all other countries, which would be the 1090 ES. There may have also been concerns that if all U.S. aircraft were equipped with 1090 ES, this lower bandwidth system could become saturated in large metropolitan areas with too many aircraft. Having a separate 978 UAT alternative offloads aircraft from the 1098 uh, ES standard by offering a carrot to users in the form of free weather. So the idea was that small airplanes might go with the 978 UAT because they have free weather, which would get them off the frequencies being used by the airliners. 
But here's the rub when it comes to using portable ADSB receivers. In the FAA's original deployment of ADSB in Alaska, which was the capstone project back in about 2003, the ADSB ground stations there broadcast continuously in unlimited mode, meaning that all traffic data for all aircraft was continuously broadcasted. However, here in the U.S., new ADSB ground stations being deployed in the lower 48 broadcast what they call a custom payload, meaning they only broadcast traffic threats for particular participating aircraft. That means those who are equipped with an ADSB out receiver. Thus, if you have just a portable ADSB receiver and no ADSB out in your aircraft, you will be seeing traffic threats for other ADSB out equipped aircraft, but you won't be seeing the traffic threats for your own aircraft. Now, iPadPilotNews.com uh, has an article that uh, talks a little bit uh, more about that in detail. Now, this is an older article from 2012, and it's talking about the Garmin GDL39 portable ADSB receiver. But everything they say applies to all of the other portable ADSB receivers on the market, such as Stratus and others. What they say is there are two basic ways to get ADSB traffic with a portable ADSB receiver air to air and ground uplink. Air to air is straightforward. All airplanes equipped with ADSB out will transmit their location and the GDL-39 will pick up these transmissions directly. Because the GDL-39 is dual band, that is it receives on both 1090 ES and 978, it will receive all ADSB out transmissions from nearby aircraft. No ground stations ever come to play, come into play. Between the air-to-air -air traffic and the ground uplink traffic, you get a very complete picture of traffic around you. Just like weather, you have to be in range of an ADSB ground station to receive this data. Now, there's a catch. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. You will only re receive this TISB information, that is the uh, information sent to you from the ground, if you are equipped with ADSB out. The FAA wants to encourage pilots to equip their airplanes with ADSB out, so they're requiring this equipment in order to receive traffic information. Their hope is that this incentive gets more airplanes flying with ADSB out sooner. Many pilots think this is a bad idea. Yeah, I'm one of those. But regardless, it's the way the system works right now. All is not lost. If you do not have ADSB out, but you are flying near another airplane that is transmitting ADSB out, you can be a parasite. That is, you can listen in on that airplane's traffic message and display nearby airplanes for that aircraft on your iPad. That's because each ADSB out airplane receives back an ADSB in traffic package from the ground station, and it's specifically tailored to their location. In particular, that ADSB out airplane will see all traffic within a 15 mile radius and plus and minus 3,500 feet of their altitude. And that's being described as a hockey puck. So if you're flying in that hockey puck close to a participating airplane that has ADSB out, you will have traffic uplink from the ground in addition to the air to air traffic. This is the best case scenario as you'll have free traffic that rivals a $15,000 active traffic system. But as you can imagine, staying within 15 miles and 3,500 feet of an ADSB out uh, airplane can be a serious limitation. When you're outside their hockey puck, you will only see air to air traffic, which is fairly limited. And they summarize it by saying, here's the one thing that is easy to remember. If you do not have ADS-B out installed in your aircraft, you will not get reliable traffic on your iPad. That doesn't mean it's worthless, just incomplete. Most often you'll see lots of air-to-air -air ADS-B traffic, which is usually airline and cargo jets. But for aircraft that don't have ADS-B out and are using a portable uh, ADS-B receiver, this traffic feature is most useful in terminal areas such as Class B and Class C airports where airliners are coming into land. There you'll see a lot of air-to-air -air ADS-B traffic regardless of what ground stations are around. This is handy if you're flying into a major airport, but GA traffic is very limited with ASB right now, so you won't see much at the country airport. So I guess the bottom line from my perspective is please, please, please be aware that if you're using a portable ADSB receiver, you are not seeing all the traffic. There may be an airplane right next to you that doesn't show up, even though your display shows lots of airplanes other places. In some ways, to me, this is a little bit misleading, much like looking at uh, XM radar. You know, people look at the XM radar uh, weather picture and they go, oh yeah, the, the rain is right there. Well, no, that's where the rain was somewhere between, you know, 
uh, seven and maybe 12 minutes ago uh, because uh, things keep moving around. I think the problem we have is that people look at a computer display and they just believe that whatever they see there is the entire story. And it's really important to understand where is that computer getting that data and what data is it not getting. Okay, enough on ADSB. I think, by the way, we'll have to talk about traffic systems more in the future because I also find a lot of people don't know all the differences between TIS and TAS and ADSB and so on. But coming up next, listener questions on basic med and how one flight school is cutting the cost of flight training. We'll be right back. And special thanks to the two people who left iTunes reviews this past week. Thanks to uh, Mike Y and uh, Nutty Dan. And speaking of iTunes, when Nicholas Jackson interviewed me a few days ago for the FS Ride Along podcast, he referred to this show as the number one aviation podcast. And yesterday, for the first time ever, we showed up on the top of two different lists. Number one in the list of top episodes and our Cirrus Vision Jet to episode was listed. And number one under top podcasts, which I think means more people subscribe that week than to any other show. So thank you very much for helping make this show at number one. Now, Mike Y said in his review, appreciate the effort keep put in the show so far. Keep it up. Thanks. Nutty Dan said, I've always enjoyed Max's co-hosting on Airplane Geeks podcast and his emphasis on the GA side of things. This podcast expands those GA discussions and covers news, safety info, and tips that will be of interest to aviation fans at any level. Often the discussions are around high-performance machines like the SR-22 and DA-42 that many of us dream of getting into someday. Worth your time. Well, great. Thanks so much for that, and thanks for taking the time to write those. Hello, Max. My name is Ryan. I'm from Bakersfield, California. Um, I really have two questions. Uh, the first is what uh, what is being done in general aviation to cut down on the cost of uh, specifically flight training? And to answer your first question, Ryan, in 2012, I was at Oshkosh and I watched a electric aircraft fly. And that's when I started looking into the economics of those. And I've become convinced that electric aircraft are exactly what it's going to take to reduce the cost of flight training. Uh, when you look at uh, the cost per hour, uh, instead of using 50, 60, you know, $70 worth of fuel, you're talking about electricity, which is on the order of uh, $5 or, or less. Of course, a lot of the other costs are still fixed, but that has the big promise of uh, finally bringing down the cost of flight training. Now, it turns out that there is something going on somewhat in your area. I attended a meeting last week where they talked about details of something that was reported on AvWeb last month, and I'll just go ahead and read from AvWeb. It says, uh, this is an April 21st issue, subsidized by local funds from Fresno County, a fleet of four Pipistrel Alpha Electro trainers will be made available for primary training in California's Central Valley late this year. Fresno County will be installing chargers for the aircraft at four local airports, Mendota, Reedley, Fresno Chandler, and a fourth airport to be determined. The Alpha Electro has a maximum endurance of approximately 90 minutes and an 85-knot cruise speed, making round-trip cross-country flights a stretch. Joseph Oldham, sustainability manager for the city of Fresno, told Avweb that the fourth airport will ideally be just over 50 nautical miles away, permitting the Alphas to make one-way flights meeting private cross-country training requirements, recharge in about 45 minutes, and return home. The fallback plan is for students to do cross-country training in the piston power version of the Alpha. Oldham told attendees at the Sustainable Aviation Symposium that Fresno hopes to have the new aircraft on hand and high-voltage chargers installed at the four chosen airports by the fall of this year. The FAA has not released a paradigm for approving electric propulsion airplanes either in certified aircraft or in light sport as Pipistrel plans for the Alpha Electro. Oldham is traveling to Washington next week to meet with the FAA about approval of electric LSAs, the last major hurdle in Fresno's race to get the Alpha Electros into service. The aircraft will likely be available for rent by area pilots, but the priority users of the aircraft will be veterans and low-income youth seeking primary flight training. Now, I did go to a meeting last week where this was discussed further. What I learned was they got a $1 million grant from uh, the Fresno County. Uh, of course, we've got four aircraft and four chargers. They're also uh, looking to allocate $190,000 for funds uh, to uh, provide flight training for low-income youth. The aircraft has a 60-kilowatt electric motor, 1,000-foot-per-minute climb rate, endurance of 1.5 hours on its 21-kilowatt-hour battery, 
with 60 minute to charge time using the 20 kilowatt chargers, which sell for about $10,000 a piece. Uh, it can also be charged uh, at a much slower rate with a less expensive charger. I asked about uh, overhaul and I was told that every 2000 hours, the battery will have to be replaced. They expect that to be about $20,000. So that's what about $10 per hour for the overhaul cost related to the battery. And I also heard that there's some work going on in Minnesota with what's called uh, Midwest Electric Aircraft. A gentleman by the name of Paul Randall is also looking apparently to set up some flight training with electric trainers. So there is a possibility that in the near future, we're going to see lower flight training costs. I would imagine that when the battery lifetime gets a little longer, uh, yeah, I think a good two hours is, is really necessary. Then we're going to start to see uh, more electric trainers being used for flight training. And then the second question is, what... Uh guidance do you recommend for looking for a, a self-study course, at least for uh, CFI? Um, I would like to um, I would like to have my written done before I go and do an actual uh, CFI class. That way it's less time and less money that I'm spending right off the bat. Ryan, if you haven't done it already, go back five episodes in this podcast for the one titled Flying Cirrus SR-22 in Diamonds, comma, CFI Training. There was a listener question toward the end, which I answered in detail about steps to take to become a flight instructor. One of those things was just to do a lot of reading. So as, as daunting as it sounds, I recommend reading the entire Far Aim, at least part 61 and uh, 91. And then the Flight Instructor Oral Exam Guide has just been updated. There was a story last week in General Aviation News that says it's now up to the seventh edition. Now, this is a book with a yellow cover, and it's one that I used years ago when I was getting my uh, flight instructor certificate. It will help you a lot with the oral exam. However, it is not sufficient in itself to be prepared for the oral exam. So I would look at that as kind of the baseline. You know, once you've read through that and you know everything in that, you can be building from there. And this is produced by ASA. You can find it at ASA2Fly. That's the number 2Fly.com. And here's an email that came from a listener who says, have you figured this out yet? It would appear from the attached and particularly the following paragraph that if the co-owner of our airplane and I get only our basic med, we lose the ability to be each other's safety pilot unless as a safety pilot, we are also PIC. But how can we be flying PIC if flying in the right seat? Well, there's a simple answer to that. And it's uh, the same answer that we've always had, oddly enough. So here's what's necessary for both people to be able to log time when one pilot is under the hood and one pilot is under the safety pilot. You must ahead of time agree that the person in the right seat, the person who is not flying, person who is the safety pilot is the PIC. They are the pilot in command. And that person does not require a third class medical. They can use just basic med. Uh, and then if the person in the left seat who is under the hood is flying, that person could also be flying under basic med. And they are able to log PIC time by virtue of the fact that they are the sole manipulator of the controls. Now, technically, they are not PIC. That's the person in the right seat. However, they can also log PIC time. And this is essentially unchanged from anything that uh, we've had in the past. That's always the way uh, two pilots have been able to log uh, PIC time simultaneously. So yes, both you and your safety pilot can have just basic med instead of a third class medical, and you can fly under the hood as long as you agree ahead of time that the safety pilot is the PIC for that flight. And finally, an email from Mike in Maynard, Mass. Mike says, the podcast website does not include the episode number for each episode. He said, I saw on my MP3 that I had number 9 and number 11, but wasn't sure about number 10, so I was looking for the numbers on the website. I really enjoy the show and have passed along the website address to my whole pilot mailing list. Hey, thanks for doing that, Mike. He says, I know it takes a lot of time and effort, and it's very much appreciated. Well, Mike, yes, you're right. It does take a lot of time, but it's also a heck of a lot of fun. And I want to apologize for sending you on a wild goose chase because I actually skipped number of things. I had uh, planned to put out the Vision Jet episode later in the week, and that would have been after this show, which is number 10. But I like the episode so much, I couldn't wait to share it. So I put number 11 out ahead of this show, which is number 10. So sorry for the confusion. Well, that wraps it up for this show. Just a quick reminder, if you're trying to decide between buying a new Cirrus or a slightly used one, please contact me and I can help you with that evaluation. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the country. Also, if you've enjoyed this show, please support it by telling your aviation friends or by leaving a review in the Apple Podcast app or by signing up for one of my courses at pilotlearning.com. In the meantime, fly safely and keep the blue side up.